Midnight Facts for Insomniacs. <laughs> I just learned something. Oh, I'm having fun now. It's crazy to me that there were public executions in France during the era of disco. Yeah, and sequin jumpsuits. But what's throwing me off is while someone was singing, ah, 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 I'm staying alive, someone was getting guillotined. Hey, Insomniacs, so Shane and I are not quite ready to start shilling for evil corporations just yet, but with the dawn of the new year, we are beginning to put out the feelers and consider some strategic partnerships with some other podcasts that we enjoy, and maybe eventually even some products or services we actually give a shit about and use. Keep in mind that our Patreon will always be 100% ad-free versions of our show, and it's totally affordable. Like It starts at $3 a month. What were you going to do with $3 a month? So this episode will feature our first promotion later in the show for one of our legit favorite things. We've both been listening to the AHC podcast. That stands for the A-Hole Court podcast, except they say the actual word. Yeah, and, you know, we swear all the time, Shane, so why didn't you? We are an explicit show, so I, I don't know why I wussed out right there. Uh, but they are seriously fun, and these guys do their research in a non-conspiracy theorist sense. On each episode, they examine the life and misdeeds of a potentially atrocious human being, and then at the end of each episode, they rate them on an awfulness scale from 1 to 11, like Mr. Rogers to Hitler. My favorite episode so far was Hilaria Baldwin, and if you don't know the story behind that trash fire narcissist, you're definitely going to want to check it out. I also recently listened to the Jake Paul episode and the Rick James episode, bitch. <laughs> and if you want to know my rating for all of them, I'll tell you in the Discord. It's a nine, bitch. <laughs> so make sure to search for the AHC podcast on your podcast player of choice. And now, on to the show. Duncan, one of our recent episodes was on death rituals, and today's topic is related this is a type of death ritual, a pre-mortem ritual that results in death. The subject that the insomniacs chose for today, public executions and the history of capital punishment. Yay! Some nice light holiday fare. Uh, what are you thankful for? Be grateful that you haven't been uh, drawn and quartered in a public square. I mean, I am daily. That's, that's always a plus. Every day that goes by in which I am not dismembered in front of a crowd is a blessing. <laughs> I would call that a bullet dodged, but moving on. You can probably guess the etymology of the term capital punishment. Uh, capital is from the Latin prefix cap for head, as in decapitate, also known as beheading, which never made sense to me. It should be deheading. Beheading sounds like you're attaching something. Yeah, it sounds like you're adding a head. It's like bejeweled is adding jewels, or bespectacled is adding glasses. If you've been decapitated, you need to beheaded. <laughs> you need to be beheaded. You, you added, you missed a B there. No, no, no. I'm missing my head and I would like to be headed now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, deheading has historically been a popular technique for making people dead. It is very effective. Uh, humans are surprisingly durable. You can cut a lot of stuff off us and we will probably survive, but one of those things is not the head. No, no. I guess unless you're a dog and it's only for a short time. Really? You're bringing yeah, that episode yeah, back? Really? I apologize. Really? Yeah. That was <laughs> not a good call, Brett. Techniques for capital punishment, though, are obviously not limited to deheading. Mm. The most popular methods of execution throughout the years have also included hanging, firing squads, electrocution, burning, gas chambers, and lethal injection. Mm. There are benefits and drawbacks to each of these techniques, all of which vary depending on whether you are the recipient or provider of the execution. Yeah, also there are benefits and, and drawbacks if you are, we'll call it, part of the crowd. Because, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, if a hanging goes wrong, you get to watch them twitch, which, yay, fuck you, pedophile. But then you have to watch them shit themselves, which is less fun. What would your preference be for both sides of the equation? Like, if you had to be executed, how would you prefer it to happen? If I'm being executed, I would really, really enjoy firing squad. Because as long as they're not cross-eyed imbeciles, you're going to die. Enjoy firing squad. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, because all you hear is a bang and then your brain stops working. I maybe prefer. I don't know that enjoy. I didn't know that that's what you're into. But I mean. <laughs> we don't kink shame. We don't kink shame. And we have discussed in the past people who wanted to die as part of their kink. It's just very hard to follow up on. I have never been happy. Yeah, I do think firing squad is the good way to go. If someone can is, has good aim and yeah. gets you directly between the eyes, then you're set. But you're not guaranteed of that. Yeah. And, it, you know, you don't know who's how far away they are. And also, maybe they knew the guy that you killed or stole money from. Or, right. You know. And then you get a gut shot and you're there for the next 10 minutes dying. Yeah. yeah. And that sucks. Yeah. So if I don't have that, 
Well, because all of these have drawbacks. If you're getting yeah. hanged, if your executioner is good, he puts the knot to the side, and when you fall, your neck breaks immediately and you're dead. Right. You don't feel a damn thing. If he's not so good or he doesn't like you, then he puts it to the back, and then you choke to death over the next 90 seconds in absolute pain. Yeah, there is no, as we will learn, there is no perfect method for executing someone that uh, gets the job done 100% successfully and cleanly you might say. Well, yeah, there's no cleanliness, but I do think deheading is the best way to go if you want immediate death. Because even if they yeah. fuck it up, you can't feel That's shit. That's the one I'm going to choose. I would say guillotine. It's going to be quick. Yeah. Suddenly you're going to be looking up at your own bloody stump. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The only danger there, I think, is like the headless chicken situation where your your body just runs around. Does that, does that happen or is that just chickens? <laughs> no, it's just chickens. <laughs> I was forced to uh, slaughter chickens when I was a teenager. Mm. My aunt had a farm and uh, I guess they thought it would be good for me. I don't... Uh, <laughs> How? Trauma, <laughs> you know, makes you stronger in life. That's what all of our parents and people from the olden times used to think. Yeah, every boomer out there is like, hey, have you seen someone die? Well, you're not strong enough. Well, they made me swim the axe myself and it was a terrible I did not do a good job the the wood fell over the wooden block fell over and the chick I didn't get all the way through the chicken's neck and then the, and then it started running around but its head was hanging it was terrible I don't know why I'm telling this story I'm <laughs> feeling really sad about even as I'm I'm sorry for this what, what, everything I'm doing right now is what is the motivation there? you're like I want to traumatize each and every single one of our listeners I have some experience with this is all I'm saying yeah. is I have been the executioner mm. for a sad little chicken and it was miserable yeah. And, uh, yeah, I, I think my point was <laughs> <laughs> way back when, <laughs> as long as the executioner is not me, yes. a 14 year old me, yes. who is an idiot and not good with an ax, yeah. uh, that would be my preference. And the guillotine in particular, not an ax. I don't want mm. someone with an ax. Yeah. I mean, a well-trained headsman is just as good as a guillotine. Is that the news that they call them? The, yeah. The headsman. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Um, sounds like a sex term, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> moving on mm -hmm. yeah the headsman if he's well trained and he's actually like an executioner he's he's skilled in both torture and beheading anyway yeah i didn't know guillotine could happen definitely guillotine if i have mm -hmm. if that if i'd known that was on the, the the docket i definitely would have chosen that one and then what if you were like an authoritarian dictator and you had to suppress dissent what would you what would your choice be for execution public execution uh burning because oh, that takes one, yeah. for fucking ever. Oh, it looks agonizing. Worst. If you want to hear screams for 40 minutes, that's a way to go. I mean, that would work. That would keep me in line. I will stop dissenting. Yeah. I have my <laughs> dissent. None more dissent. I, I am done dissent. <laughs> my dissent was never that important. No. I am now recalibrating. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm an enthusiastic supporter. As I have said, uh, whoever takes over, I am immediately betraying either my compatriots or the human race as a whole. To uh, our cephalopod overlords. Yes, I remember. Yes. <laughs> or to aliens, whatever, robots, aliens, or octopi, yes. whatever it takes. <laughs> so the general trend worldwide and over the course of history has actually been toward more humane methods of execution. Obviously, there is a risk of minimizing the deterrent effect when you make the experience more palatable, but you gain the benefit of looking less like a sadistic authoritarian regime. Mm. For instance, the guillotine might not seem particularly pleasant, but it was actually developed as a less painful and cruel alternative to hanging or drawing and quartering, etc. Yeah, drawing and quartering is right up there with, with burning. Like, if you're trying to think of the most painful, horrific way to do someone in, four horses and rope, good way to go. It also doesn't seem 100%. Like, you can lose your limbs and still survive. Not back then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're falling in horse shit, dude. Well, was, You're not going to live. <laughs> that was back when you stubbed your toe or cut your finger <laughs> and immediate. Yeah, it was gangrene. Now, I should probably pause and acknowledge that this is a very controversial topic, and it's okay to have strong opinions. Although, for once, I don't. Mm -mm. I am conflicted about the death penalty. Mm. And we'll talk a little bit about our personal views later, but the bottom line is that the international community is just as conflicted as we are. Yeah. Currently, 55 countries still implement capital punishment, almost half as many as the 109 that have abolished it. But those 55 are some of the larger countries in the world, population-wise. Uh, more than half of the world's population, fully 60% of humans, live under governments that reserve the right to kill them, for whatever reason. Mm. And 100% of the people in this room live in a country in which we could be put to death by our government. Yeah. Though at least for now, we only have to worry about the death penalty if we commit some especially heinous crime... Or, of course, if we are wrongly accused and convicted of a crime, uh, which is a major problem with the death penalty. Yeah. And we'll dive more deeply into the statistics on that later. Obviously, there are no take-backsies 
with capital punishment. If you spend years in jail for robbery and then some DNA evidence exonerates you, there's at least the option to sue for damages and rebuild your life. Right. On the other hand, if you're proven innocent five minutes after riding the lightning, oops. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> thoughts and prayers. <laughs> thoughts and prayers. Maybe the state will like uh, throw a few bucks to your family, but there's pretty much no way to put that particular toothpaste back in that particular tube. No, you will get a very strongly and, you know, florid version of our bad in the mail. So capital punishment has been practiced by humans since the beginning of recorded history. In America, the death penalty was first implemented with the Jamestown colony in Virginia. That was the first official implementation. Obviously, people were being dispatched in the New World left and right. Just ask the Native Americans. But the first recorded trial that led to an execution took place in 1608, when Captain George Kendall was executed for treason under vague and still not fully understood circumstances. He might have been a mutineer. He might have been a spy for the Spanish. He was definitely shot full of holes by a firing squad. Since then, the death penalty has been legal in America at the federal level and in slightly more than half the states. So 27 states still allow for the death penalty, while 23 have abolished it. But of those 27 killer states, seven of them have a moratorium that makes it functionally impossible to execute convicted criminals. And California is one. In fact, if you're planning to commit an aggravated murder, Mm -hmm. I would recommend California, Alaska, Washington, Maine, or Hawaii. I'm sorry, could you say those again? I'm just making a a list. What? what? There are uh, 15 other options, 15 other murder sanctuary states, if you will. But those five are the most scenic. Mm. So you can enjoy spectacular vistas while dispatching your victims. Interestingly, Virginia is still the leader when it comes to total executions since the 1600s, about 1,390, while Texas is still a bit behind at 1,325. Come on, Texas. You can do better. Be better, Texas. Well, don't count the Lone Star State out yet. It is on the move. Since 1976, Texas has been the king of capital punishment. Texas has executed some 570 people during that time, compared to Virginia's measly 113. Damn. And those are the only two states in triple digits. The next closest is Georgia at 75, then Alabama at 66, and California has only managed to kill around 13 people between uh, 1976 and 2019. Not winners. Kind of embarrassing, mm. honestly. Just a measly baker's dozen of executions. You might notice that these statistics specifically apply to the time period post-1976, mm. and that's because the death penalty was paused in America for four years, from 72 to 76. This was the result of a Supreme Court case, uh, Furman v. Georgia. Basically, Georgia was using a sketchy system called unitary trials that combined the verdict and sentencing into one process, and the Supreme Court struck down all of those verdicts in a 5-4 decision, Hmm. which caused executions to be put on pause nationwide. Quote, this decision was reached by the suspicion that many states, particularly in the South, were using capital punishment as a form of legal lynching of African-American males, inasmuch as almost all executions for non-homicidal rape in the southern states involved a black perpetrator. Damn. Immediately after the decision, uh, southern states acknowledged their shameful practice of weaponizing the legal system, collectively apologized for their tragic legacy of racism, and began actively reforming their justice systems. These are lies. That's ridiculous. Yeah. They, they immediately began looking for loopholes to get around the ruling. In 1976, the Supreme Court gave the go-ahead for the resumption of capital punishment via the Gregg v. Georgia decision, allowing death verdicts to resume as long as the trial and sentencing procedures were separate. You will be shocked to learn that implementation of capital punishment soared, and southern states gleefully resumed convicting and murdering their black residents at an alarmingly high rate. Shocked, I say. <laughs> Appalled, even. The Supreme Court trend since the Gregg decision, however, has been to enact limitations and scale back the number of cases that actually qualify for the death penalty. So in 1977, the Coker v. Georgia decision barred the death penalty in adult rape cases, and in 1980, the bar was raised once again in Godfrey v. Georgia, in which the Supreme Court limited the death penalty to cases involving aggravating factors. Hmm. Interesting that all these cases involve Georgia. I was just about to say, I was like, damn, Georgia, you... you Can you keep your name out Supreme Court's mouth, please? Supreme Court just keeps having to step in and mediate. They're like, settle down, Georgia. (laughs) Easy, Georgia. Whoa. Georgia's like, you're not my daddy. I'll kill everyone. (laughs) In 2002, the Supreme Court took away the ability of states to execute the mentally challenged. And in 2005, the death penalty was removed as an option for minors. So no one under the age of 18 can be sentenced to death in America. 
that is so weird to me. If you want to commit murder, just make sure you do it on the night before your 18th birthday because you obviously become aware of the consequences of your actions promptly at midnight when you turn 18. Right. You turn into a murder pumpkin. You're like, oh, shit. (laughs) Finally, in a controversial 2008 decision, the court officially confined the death penalty to murder cases, period, removing the ability to apply the death sentence for child rape. The decision was criticized by both presidential candidates Barack Obama and John McCain at the time. I mean, I'm with them on this one. Surprisingly, no candidate has ever publicly come out as being soft on child rape. (laughs) Although I feel like that's such a winning platform. Why wouldn't they do it? I mentioned that capital punishment is legal at the federal level, and maybe I should quickly explain for anyone who doesn't know. So individual states can charge people with crimes committed within their borders, but the federal government can also press charges if those crimes cross state lines or involve the military or public officials, etc., And there are also a few other specific crimes that fall directly under the federal umbrella. So kidnapping, child porn, credit fraud, tax evasion, obscenity. There's a sizable list of crimes on which the federal government has effectively called dibs. Hmm. However, there had only been three federal executions between the resumption of the death penalty in 1976 and the inauguration of the Trump administration. During his 2016 campaign, Trump had promised to revoke the death penalty moratorium, but after winning the Electoral College, the losing the popular vote... The Trump administration executed only seven convicts during the four years between the night that he won the election and the night that he lost the next one. Mm -hmm. As soon as he lost the 2020 election, and he did lose the election, by the way, it's just crazy that we even have to say that. After he lost the election, his administration scrambled to execute as many convicts as possible during those last few months, while also pardoning a bunch of Trump's white collar criminal friends and then inciting an attack on the Capitol. It was, a, it was a busy time. For- yeah, I mean, shit to do. But what's weird is that they're like, no, 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 we got to kill these people. But what made them more killable then? Well, I think he assumed that he was going to have four more years to take care of it. And then he was like, uh-oh, got to speed this thing up. <laughs> so he was a procrastinator. <laughs> he was a procrastinator of murder. But also, it's just funny because, like, that's how we – this is another one of the ways we know that he knows he lost the election. Right. He knew he was going to have to leave. And he was like, I'm going to kill as many motherfuckers as I can before I get out of here. <laughs> But yeah, procrastinator. He had a lot to do. He had, to, you know, so many things to handle before you give up the presidency. I've got criminals to pardon, an insurrection to incite, and Antifa to frame for it. I'm swamped. Well, you catch some rest. You haven't got your health. You haven't got anything. In total, Trump managed to execute 13 convicts before the moratorium was reinstated under President Biden. I checked out a list of the 16 people who have been federally executed since the 70s, Mm -hmm. 13 of them under Trump, and wow, it is hard for me not to side with death penalty supporters in these cases. We are talking about killers like Alfred Bourgeois, who was sentenced to death for assault, sexual abuse, and rape of his two-year-old daughter. Yep, don't need him anymore. Or Wesley Ira Perkey, convicted for the, quote, kidnapping, rape, and murder of 16-year-old Jennifer Long in 1998. Perky dismembered and burned her body and scattered the remains into a septic pond. He was also convicted of the murder of 80-year-old polio patient Mary Ruth Bales. Yeah, not not someone we need to really keep on ice and figure out how his brain works. You're going to kill an 80-year-old with polio? (laughs) How impatient are you? Seriously. (laughs) Just just wait a while. (laughs) Get some popcorn, sit back. It's going to be just about 10 minutes. What's up, Insomniacs? It's your boys, Randy, Mikey, and Buddy, and we're the hosts of AHC Podcast. What the hell is AHC Podcast? Well, it's short for Asshole Court. We take a deep dive on public figures and rate them on a scale from Mr. Rogers to Hitler to see how much of an asshole they really are. It's like hanging out with your immature, vaguely intelligent, funny friends from high school. You can find us anywhere you download your favorite podcast or on patreon.com slash AHC Podcast. So check us out. Now back to your boys at Midnight Facts for Insomniacs. And then there was the only woman executed by federal courts since the 1970s, Lisa Marie Montgomery, who in 2004 strangled pregnant acquaintance Bobby Joe Stinnett and cut the fetus out of her womb. The two women had met in a chat room for fans of rat terriers called Ratter Chatter. <laughs> It's just, none of this is funny, but that, that's, yeah, that's kind of funny. That's funny. <laughs> I don't care who you are. <laughs> they met on Ratter Chatter and things went splitter splatter. And, you know, that's oh, just how God. it goes. Jesus. 
Uh, the victim was a dog breeder, and Montgomery pretended to be a prospective client to gain access to her house. The child actually survived. The fetus was cut out, and it was so close to viable that it, uh, it lived. Holy fuck. That kid's never not going to therapy. Oh, Lord. I cannot really argue with executing anyone on this federal list, to be honest. Just reading through it. Not thus far, yeah. I'm good to go. Uh, It seems like the feds have traditionally only executed the worst of the worst. Of course, the problem for me is that federal executions are just a drop in the bucket. You still have a ton of people being sentenced to death in places like Texas under sketchy circumstances. And as we'll see later, there have been convicts on death row who were exonerated right before they could be unjustly executed. It's a very thorny issue. Yeah, that's generally where my hang-up comes with with executions. Yeah, and we'll get to that. Uh, So obviously, we Americans have a long and complicated history with capital punishment. And the United States is also an innovator in death penalty technology. In 1888, New York doctor Julius Mount Blyer developed the lethal injection cocktail that consists of a barbiturate, paralytic, and potassium solution. According to Wikipedia, he, quote, praised it as being cheaper than hanging, unquote. How much really were you spending on hemp rope, bro? Like, seriously? I did a ton of searching to try to find the rationale for this. Yeah. Hanging seems pretty thrifty to me. I just, were they importing silkworm rope from the Orient? (laughs) You can reuse a noose. Dude, you you can reuse a scaffold. You build that shit once. Unless you're hanging like 400 pound lumpers, like you you go and be all right. You don't need a scaffold. I mean, unfortunately, as we've learned through American history, tree branches, anything can work. I don't understand what they were spending a bunch of money on that uh, these drugs could possibly be cheaper. So yeah, I do not have a solid answer regarding the finances of hanging versus lethal injection. But interestingly, lethal injection was initially rejected as an option when it was proposed by Blyer in the 1800s. Uh, Maybe they checked the guy's math. (laughs) They're like, no, bro, you're dumb. Rope is super cheap. Instead, uh, lethal injection would first be implemented by the Nazis in World War II. So that's a great pedigree for this particular execution method. Dope. I would think association with the Nazis would be a disqualifying factor, but uh, nope. Would you really? Would you? Because I think most of the shit, most of the technology we have in America could be associated loosely with the Nazis. I wouldn't go that far, but yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, Lethal injection wouldn't be used in America until after the death penalty pause of the 1970s, when Texas switched from electrocution to lethal injection in 1977. Mm. Ironically, even though it's supposedly the most humane and somehow affordable version of capital punishment... (laughs) It has proven remarkably difficult to implement. Since 2016, many states have struggled to obtain the drugs for lethal injection because the suppliers of these products, including Pfizer and pretty much all European suppliers, for some reason don't want their drugs to be associated with incarceration and death. Weird. Apparently the term death cocktail does not go over well with focus groups and advertisers. No, you're right. You know, as a Opposed to Oxycontin, which, you know, rolls right off the tongue or more accurately down the tongue and has killed far fewer people. You're being sarcastic, I take it. Cause what gave it away? <laughs> Oxycontin, at least, I think, at first, they, the marketing was very deceptive, and it sounded great. It's like, are you experiencing some mild uh, knee pain? And also, do you want to uh, sleep well at night and develop a crippling drug dependency? We got you covered. <laughs> However, some of those death penalty-loving states have proved remarkably innovative when it comes to obtaining that sweet, sweet murder juice... <laughs> They can't figure out how to balance their budgets or feed their citizens, but they get super creative when it comes to emptying out their prisons the hard way. Yeah, and why are they having so much trouble coming up with these chemicals? Can't you make fentanyl in a fucking bathtub? Like, just really? Yeah, well, currently they're actually experimenting with different versions of the drug cocktail, uh, and some are even going beyond drugs altogether. Wyoming and Utah are considering uh, bringing back firing squads while Nebraska has switched to their own version of the drug cocktail that includes fentanyl and diazepam. That'll do it. Can't be too mad at that one. It sounds like a rockin' Friday. I mean, what it sounds like is a fucking heroin pack. Like, it's essentially yeah. what we're going to be doing. Yeah, look, pro tip. If you want to get super high and go out with a bang and you can't afford fentanyl, and I guess you're in Nebraska and you don't, you're willing to kill a bunch of people, it's, it's a very specific scenario, but <laughs> you never, we're just providing uh, info here. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, if you're in Nebraska, honestly, how many people do you really like? If you're in Nebraska, you definitely want to kill people. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're very upset about being in Nebraska. <laughs> There's nothing to listen to but insane clown posse and uh, nothing but miles and miles of cows and grass to really contemplate. You're going to kill somebody. So some of the other countries that still implement CP, 
that is capital punishment, CP if you're nasty, <laughs> include the U.S., Japan, India, Taiwan, Egypt, and China, which as we learned recently on an After Midnight episode, is the most enthusiastic and prolific executioner of its own citizens. I mean, they got enough of them. Out of European and Eastern European countries, only Belarus hasn't fully abolished capital punishment. Hmm. Belarus, in fact, executed a convict just last year in spite of the disapproval of its neighbor states. Typical Belarus. <laughs> if there's one thing I know about Belarus, it's that it has not abolished capital punishment. I, I don't know anything about Belarus. That but is I literally the one thing I know about okay. Belarus. <laughs> one of the reasons the death penalty has been historically popular is that all of the other alternatives are less convenient and potentially more dangerous. If you're a government or monarch and you want to keep criminals off the streets, you have a few options. You can banish or exile them, but that's risky because sometimes they sneak back in, often harboring a bit of a grudge at that point. Weird. So maybe you build prisons instead. Well, in that case, you have to spend resources creating secure facilities to house criminals and staff those facilities and pay for food and medical care to keep them alive. It's a whole thing. Yeah. But why would you bother with any of that when you can eliminate the problem via a literal flip of the switch or a swing of an axe? Yeah, I mean, generally, I would definitely go with option three, where I am monarch. Or more creative and sadistic methods, if you're into that kind of thing. I am. Plus, bonus, when you kill your enemies, there's the aforementioned deterrent effect. Uh, after a few state-sponsored murders, it is theoretically less likely that your citizens will commit murders, because now they know you're not fucking around. Yeah. Of course, for the deterrent effect to work, you have to get the word out, which is where public executions come into play. For authoritarian regimes, killing criminals in public is just sensible policy. And not just criminals. Dissidents, dissenters, undesirables. Anyone who is not on board with the party line can be dispatched in a public square with as much pageantry as you deem appropriate. You can make it a party. Women who read, enemies of the state, people from countries you don't m much like. Homosexuals. Yeah. Podcasters. Hey. Other undesirables. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> it was funny up until then. But yeah, you make it a big uh, a big production. Get people excited. Get it. They, they get dressed up. They get their tickets for the execution gala. Just don't sit in the splash zone. <laughs> wow, you just made public execution into a Gallagher show. Yikes! Bring your tarp. R.I.P. By the way, <laughs> uh, public executions started going out of fashion in the latter half of the 19th century and were abolished worldwide by the late 20th. The last public execution held in America took place in Owensboro, Kentucky in 1936. 26-year-old Rainey Bethea confessed to the rape and murder of a 70-year-old woman, and the jury sentenced him to hang after deliberating for four and a half minutes. <laughs> <laughs> they thought long and hard about that one. They're like, mm, fuck him. I think like four of the minutes was deciding what they were going to have for lunch. Right. And then they were like, oh, and we're killing this guy, right? It, yeah. Oh, that's what I thought. Y'all want nachos? I kind of want sandwich. What? Are we going to kill him? Yeah, but duh. <laughs> I do think he was guilty, by the way. And it was a pretty horrific murder, but the entire trial lasted approximately three hours and was absolutely a farce. Damn. They were fixing to kill this guy for minute one. Mm. The execution was also notable for a couple other reasons. The sheriff responsible for administering the execution was a woman, which was a first for a public execution in America. And the man who eventually offered his services to execute the execution, so to speak, to, I guess, pull the lever. Wrong lever! <laughs> That's, you don't want to hear that. <laughs> the execution. Uh, former police officer Arthur L. Hash was uh, visibly drunk. Nice. And the entire event turned into a media circus and contributed to the demise of public executions nationwide. And now all I can hear is the Monty Python music. <laughs> this guy stumbles over to a lever, pulls the wrong one, judge falls out of his chair, stumbles over to another level, pulls it, jury's let out of their box. I don't know. It's just like... Yeah, they didn't give a good explanation of, like, why him being drunk mattered that much. It mm. seems like even a drunk can pull a lever. I don't, did he just, like, vomit and fall over? And <laughs> it was an hour later, the guy was still standing there? I don't... <laughs> they had to wait till they woke back up. <laughs> no, no, I'll get to it. He, no, he he does this all the time. He'll be fine in like five minutes. Thank God there was no YouTube because I, <laughs> I, I definitely would be looking that up right now and I don't Dude. need to see that. So. No. So Europe might seem a bit more progressive when it comes to the death penalty, but I was shocked to learn that the last public execution in Europe took place in 1977 by a guillotine. I'm sorry, fucking what? A Tunisian pimp living in France named Hamida Jandubi was convicted of torturing and strangling one of his prostitutes 
He also beat her and put a cigarette out on her genitals in front of a bunch of other women. It was awful. Thick. Fuck that guy. I wish his punishment had been more painful. He did not deserve the expediency of the guillotine. Yeah. Remember what I said about fire? Yeah. The death penalty in France would be abolished in 1981, four years later. It's crazy to me that there were public executions in France during the era of disco. Yeah, and sequin jumpsuits. But what's throwing me off is while someone was singing, I, 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 I'm staying alive, someone was getting guillotined. <laughs> you remember yeah, the thing that fair. killed the, the French royal family way back in the French fucking mm. revolution a couple hundred years before that or whatever? Fucking what? You didn't update that shit? Yeah. I wonder if the Bee Gees, it was a subtle protest song against uh, French execute probably not probably not <laughs> that was a reach dude <laughs> you were like i remember maybe they really like french pimps i don't know i really like the bgs and i want to give them uh, more credit extra credit mm. yeah i really hate the bgs and i want to go with your thing so yeah, either way <laughs> really it works like both ways fuck what? them what do you forever. think about the bgs um all of the things the, you did, what the amazing harmonies the catchy riffs yes all of the amazing harmonies that take place at testicle shattering <laughs> high levels <laughs> I hate when Mariah Carey goes that high, too. It does, it's just a pitch thing for me. Yeah. It, that just sounds like dogs fighting while they're being neutered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It sounds like neutering without anesthesia. It does I'm sound not a little it. bit husky-esque. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I see it. But even though the public version of capital punishment is no longer a thing in the Western world, plenty of countries are still trigger-happy with the DP. That is death, death penalty. <laughs> Not the way you want to say it that. Sounds like something else. But <laughs> I said CP before. That sounds yeah. like child porn. And DP sounds like, you, you know, what? I, need I mean, to, it's getting better, but not by much. I need to rein in my acronyms. Yeah. You know. Most countries these days reserve the death penalty for convicted murderers. But of course, there's no requirement to set the bar that high. 35 countries have authorized the death penalty for nonviolent drug offenses. Many in Southeast Asia, countries like Thailand and Vietnam... In Vietnam, getting caught with more than 1.3 pounds of heroin results in immediate execution. Which I can kind of understand, because what are you doing with a pound of heroin anyway? You got a serious tolerance, man. You no, you got a serious true. problem. You're not long for this world anyway. Well, you have a serious problem if you're doing heroin in the first place. But uh, once you get up to 1.3 pounds, it's like, all right, you, may, you might need a little heroin break to... <laughs> I mean, I did OTC heroin for years and was fine. I wasn't doing no pound and a half of it. Fuck me. Well, either way, pro tip, Vietnamese junkies, keep mm. it under a pound. Just yeah. stay safe out there. Yeah, yeah. In 2020, China, Saudi Arabia, and Iran combined for only 30 drug executions. That was way down from a high of 755 in 2015. Of course, that was mostly due to COVID. So Iranians, don't bust out your bongs and hookahs just yet. <laughs> According to Harm Reduction International, more than 3,000 people worldwide are currently on death row for drug offenses, and presumably governments will be working through their backlogs now that the pandemic is receding. <laughs> working through their backlogs. Like, all right, everybody, the machine is broken down. Let's get it back up to the high revs. Let's, we got this. It's the Trump strategy. Yeah. Like, Can we build like a really big fan with blades on it? Like, <laughs> rang, just throw them through it. Just a meat grinder. Yeah. Eesh. It is tough to find a bright side to COVID, but hey, it was good for imprisoned Saudi Arabian crackheads while it lasted. <laughs> Sentence I never thought I'd actually hear. They got Fair a enough. Brief reprieve. Yeah. And now they're sweating again. Mm. Not just from the, Get the DTs. Yeah. You know. Incidentally, and this is true, Donald Trump has recently stated that if reelected, he would call for legislation authorizing the death penalty for drug offenders here in America. So that's awesome. <sighs> Half of my high school senior class would be wiped out. Dude, the podcaster across from you would be wiped out. <laughs> You're a drug dealer? No, but I fucking would have drug convictions. <laughs> yeah, just every meth head I know is a MAGA voter. He's, he's eliminating his base. <laughs> <laughs> he eliminating base heads is what he's doing. <laughs> and then, of course, there are countries with theocratic governments where religion rules. Quote, in some countries, such as Afghanistan, Brunei, Iran, Mauritania, Nigeria, Pakistan, and Saudi Arabia, violations of blasphemy laws can carry the possibility of the death penalty, unquote. So for many countries, the bar for execution is set at first-degree murder, but for others, it's murder and or talking smack about imaginary sky people. Yeah, yeah, which I feel actually is definitely the more dangerous of the two, because talking about imaginary sky people in a bad way is far, far worse than killing thy neighbor. 
On a related note, quote, 22 countries have laws against apostasy, the act of abandoning one's faith, unquote. Yes. So don't change your mind if you live in Brunei. <laughs> Just kidding. I mean, no, I wasn't. I totally believe now in God still. You know the saying, once you go Islam, you never go back because Brunei will freaking kill you. <laughs> I think, isn't that a saying? Yeah, totally. I heard it just yesterday. Never. Pakistan sentenced 17 people to death for blasphemy in 2019, quote, including a university lecturer accused of having insulted the prophet Muhammad verbally and on Facebook, unquote. Well, you see, I thought he was good to go until he said Facebook, because, you know, if it happens on Facebook, it's real. He was posting dank memes of Muhammad. And only the dankest of memes will get you executed. <laughs> I think he was just Muhammad shit posting at that point. Interestingly, the Pakistani government has yet to actually execute anyone for blasphemy. They're just sentencing people to years of anxiety, <laughs> making them wait to be executed. That is pretty harsh. Actually. I mean, yeah, that's fucking a bit more sadistic than the actual execution, I feel. Good night, Wesley. I'll most likely kill you in the morning. <laughs> Good night, blasphemer. I may or may not kill you next year. The death penalty historically has had a few misfires. Uh, not so much in the modern era, because we are extremely determined to finish the job these days, mm. as we'll cover soon. But in the past, there were people who survived their executions. Most of them involved hangings. Mm -hmm. My favorite story comes from Fiji in 1872 and concerns a man named Antonio Franks, who would become known as the Man Franks. Not to be confused with Anne Franks, which is slightly different. Both uh, not great endings. No. Yeah. no. It's not a good sign when the media doesn't even bother with your full name. It shows how much anyone cares about what's going to happen to you. Yeah, I mean, that is a step just aside from that dude Franks. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like they're going to kill that man Franks. <laughs> nice weather today. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing later? <laughs> Franks was a sailor who murdered a shipmate during an on-deck brawl over a woman, and he was sentenced to be hung. The scene is described in a Fiji Times article from that same year and summarized by a website called The Week. Quote, the execution took place hours after it was scheduled because the sheriff didn't find the established time convenient. The rope they'd set out got wet in the rain and had to be held over a fire to dry. Well, why? Nothing better for structural integrity than toasting some plant fibers. <laughs> and what's, wet plant fibers tend to be stronger. I don't really know what they're on about. I don't know why they needed a dry rope. Well, if it's wet, there's a lot of friction, and it's harder to tighten, because they ended up having a bunch of trouble tightening the rope, as we'll see. Oh, okay. After placing it over Frank's head, he had the utmost difficulty in making it fit anything like tight. I guess this was the executioner. But not nearly so tight as it should have been. Frank's dropped, but after three minutes of silence, started moving and talking, asking to be put out of his misery. <laughs> um, I'm not dead yet! <laughs> Could I uh, please have a bullet or perhaps a sword? This is very uncomfortable. <laughs> Good God. I mean, the crick in my neck is in fact gone, but... Um... <laughs> At this point, I would like to uh, to die. That'd be great. Could you make with, with the dying part? Because it's not happening right now. This little... is quite boring. Um, is there something else coming on? I could go for a show. Since his hands were improperly tied, he managed to reach up and pull the rope from his throat forgiving those around him for the, quote, black job they'd made of his execution. Very forgiving guy. I, I feel like mine would be far more expletive-laced and would involve running. I'm not sure that they heard him correctly. Mm. Yeah. His throat had been compressed a little. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think it was a little mush. They didn't hear the expletives. Yes. Yeah. yes. Finally, an official cut Franks down. He landed with a thud as no one had thought to ease him to the ground. After watching such a spectacle, no one wanted to go through it again, and Franks was spared death, unquote. Wow. They fully wussed out on that one. Like, how wishy-washy well, are you guys? What you, I mean, the executioners were like, round two? And everyone was like, I'm good. That's, I mean, you've got to watch. <laughs> this public killing was surprisingly distasteful. <laughs> Not the family-friendly adventure that we had anticipated. I think we'll pass. I just had my two two-year-olds throw up. The man, Franks, was subsequently presumed dead when a ship to which he was assigned, the Marion Rennie, was lost at sea. Mm -hmm. You cannot outsail karma, apparently. Yeah, I was going to say, nature just took care of that one. Mm -hmm. They're like, all right, dummies, you clearly can't do this. <laughs> and squall. So now we're going to dive into the controversial stuff. What are the arguments for and against capital punishment? Mm. Let's start with the arguments for, because those are simple and obvious. Mm. It's retribution. Just an eye for an eye. 
you murder someone, there is no way to make amends or provide restitution. How could you possibly pay your debt to society or to the family of the victim when you have taken something that can never be replaced? The only appropriate and sufficient resolution, some people argue, is to take a life in exchange for a life. There's also the rabid dog argument. This is the idea that there are some criminals who are irredeemable, and keeping them alive is pointless and most likely dangerous. A rabid dog can't be placated or rehabilitated, it can't be reasoned with, it's not going to get better. There is no cure, and there's no point in keeping the dog alive, because there's no upside. Taxpayers have no choice but to feed and house the rabid dog until it dies, or escapes, or spreads its infection somehow. I'm I'm in line with that one. The first one, I'm pretty sure we could find things around it if there was a way to like cerebrally neuter them with or or something with like technology mm-hmm. where they could be their brains could be given back to them. If we get to that point, we could probably go in and fix their brains and whatever's wrong with it and make them redeemable. I like my way better. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I see what you're saying, though. I find this argument to be a little bit rude and insensitive, but also somewhat compelling. Mm. Uh, I'm not saying prisoners are like dogs, but the rabies analogy strikes a chord with me. Yeah. And I think we're on the same page with that because I think there are some people who you're just, they're never going to be okay. I mean, it's clinically provable. There are certain types and deaths of like pedophilia or sociopathy that you cannot cure. They don't even think they're sick. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, psychopathic narcissism, sociopaths, right? That is the most dangerous trait in humans to me, toxic narcissism. If you have not followed this one case, uh, look up a guy named Daryl Brooks. He was recently sentenced to life in prison for running over a bunch of people at a parade in Wisconsin. Have you heard about this guy? Mm. Check out the antics that he pulled at the trial. He is just incapable of sympathy for other humans. He sees himself as the victim and in my opinion, he and people like him are not capable of reform. He's not. There's no point in waiting for that guy to get better. It's not going to happen. No, absolutely. There, like I said, there's certain there's a certain level of of child fucker that is just like you're never going to get better. You think what you did is totally fine and defensible. Like you don't want to get better. You don't see any problem with it. Why yeah. keep you? But there are some really compelling arguments against the death penalty. For one, there's a remarkably simple and obvious legal argument. An eye for an eye is no longer the law of the land, so why would we implement it for one single offense? If a criminal gets convicted of assault, we do not sentence that person to be assaulted. We don't rape rapists, so why are we killing killers? I mean, that's not a very compelling argument. (laughs) If somebody beats the shit out of somebody in a bar, they probably need a good ass kicking. If you (laughs) rape somebody, I think 10 or 12 rapes afterwards, you're going to be like, man, I fucked up. I shouldn't have done that. But why do you think that our society has decided that that's not okay? That we, it's an eye for an eye is not the way to handle justice. Well, I think that has come around because, A, we got terribly, terribly soft and actually believed in the sanctity of life, which, as George Carlin stated, is a bullshit thing that we but made isn't up. isn't getting soft just being more civilized? I mean, the, the more civilization advances, the less they're okay with violent retribution and revenge. Like, those things become less and less emphasized. Abolitionists also point to the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution, which prohibits cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, many people feel that being told the exact date that you're going to be killed and having to, like, count down the days to your demise is cruel and unusual. There have been steps taken to make executions more humane, as we've discussed, but it is hard to argue that there haven't been plenty of cruel and unusual executions, even in the modern era. The process of executing a criminal is nowhere near an exact science. Over the course of history, there have been some horrific fuck-ups that resulted in truly grisly, traumatic scenes, and these have spanned every type of execution, from lethal injection to gas chambers to the electric chair. Yep. Some examples from uh, deathpenalty.org. Quote, April 22, 1983, Alabama, John Evans, electrocution. After the first jolt of electricity, sparks and flames erupted from the electrode attached to Evans' leg. The electrode burst from the strap holding it in place and caught on fire. Smoke and sparks also came out from under the hood in the vicinity of Evans' left temple. Two Mm. physicians entered the chamber and found a heartbeat. The electrode was reattached to his leg and another jolt of electricity was applied. This resulted in more smoke and burning flesh. Again, the doctors found a heartbeat. Ignoring the pleas of Evans' lawyer, a third jolt of electricity was applied. The execution took 14 minutes and left Evans' body charred and smoldering, unquote. Yeah, and and this is why I've never gotten behind electrocution or other things like that as a form of, of killing somebody. Like, that's that's not a good way to go. No, I mean, it is similar to being burned alive in some ways yeah. because it can last a long time and you can catch on fire. And there's very, there's far less likelihood 
than people think of you getting it right and stopping the heart. Yeah, apparently, from what I've been reading, it's absolutely true. Yeah. But this happens with, like, every type of execution. None of them, it turns out, are very foolproof Mm -hmm. at all. And a lot of the people who are administering it seem to be fools. And so it needs to be foolproof. (laughs) Right. A bit more study should go into our executioners. Quote, September 2nd, 1983, Mississippi. This is Jimmy Lee Gray. Asphyxiation. Officials had to clear the room eight minutes after the gas was released when Gray's desperate gasps for air repulsed witnesses. Quote, Jimmy Lee Gray died banging his head against a steel pole in the gas chamber while the reporters counted his moans. Later, it was revealed that the executioner, Barry Bruce, was drunk. Unquote. First of all, I have to say, well, no shit. Your job is an executioner. You're not sober. Yeah, Mm. after a while, you're going to be self-medicating Yeah, if you are human. Rather heavily, (laughs) yeah. If you you have a single shred of of human decency. And then second of all, how do you fuck up chlorine gas or something like that? Also, what did they expect? It was death by asphyxiation and he was gasping for air. I mean, How do you think asphyxiation occurs? What's what, I think the problem is that like he shouldn't have been able to get up and bang his head against a pole in the middle of the chamber. They should have like securely had him down or something. I, I don't know the details of this, but it's pretty awful to watch someone like bang their head against a pole as they die gasping for air. I, especially if you have like the victim's families in there. Yeah. Like they want retribution, but they probably don't want to never sleep again. Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> Nightmares of gasping like fish on the f- tied to a floor. Yeah. Probably not the way they wanted to go. Not ideal. No. There's just one more. I have there are tons of these. Yeah. Quote December 13th, 1988, Texas, Raymond Landry, lethal injection. Two minutes after the drugs were administered, the syringe came out of Landry's vein, spraying the deadly chemicals across the room toward witnesses. A spokesman for the Texas Department of Correction, Charles Brown, said there was something of a delay in the execution because of what officials called a blowout. (laughs) Unquote. So we got a perm. It's cool. (laughs) What do you do during an execution? It's not a great sign when a screw-up is so common that they have a name for it. Yeah. This isn't the first time. No. Yeah. When, when you've fucked up often enough that they have a slang term for it, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're not killing it. Yeah. Uh, ooh, it's bad choice of words. True. Yeah. <laughs> and then the other thing is, with lethal injections, another one of the fun things they would do is get too much of one drug and not enough of another. Ooh. And I could never decide if that was on purpose, like somebody just being deliberately sadistic because they hated the guy enough. So you get like paralyzed first and then like no, no, last no. a long time before you die because that's that's my nightmare right there. What they would do is what would happen would be they would get like very little of the thing that's supposed to put you out. Mm. And then you would get a paralytic and a sedative and then the thing that like kills you. Right. And so what they would get is a very small amount of the sedative, a bunch of the paralytic and then a bunch of the, the death. Yeah. Or a bunch of the death and a little bit of the paralytic and almost none of the so other you, thing. You're thrashing on that table, flip flopping on that table like a fish out of water. Yeah. Clearly dying. And unable to do anything about it or say anything. Right. Yeah. And that's just like, oh. That's one mm-hmm. Metallica. This is a nightmare. Yeah. That's like my biggest fear is the whole paralyzed and can't explain what's going on. And yeah. And that's the thing is we don't we don't know how bad it got for some of these guys. There is no postmortem you know, survey. Yeah. <laughs> There's no exit interview. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and of course, horrific execution fiascos are not just a thing of the past. On November 18th, just about a week ago from when we're recording this show, the scheduled execution of killer-for-hire Kenneth Eugene Smith in Alabama was temporarily called off due to complications. Quote, prison staff tried for about an hour to get the two required intravenous lines connected to Kenneth Eugene Smith, 57. They established one line but were unsuccessful with a second line after trying several locations on Smith's body. Officials then tried a central line, which involves a catheter placed into a large vein, In September, the state called off the scheduled execution of another inmate, Alan Miller, because of difficulty accessing his veins. Miller said in a court filing that prison staff poked him with needles for more than an hour, and at one point they left him hanging vertically on a gurney before announcing they were stopping, unquote. All right, so because dude didn't drink enough water and his veins were collapsed because he was dehydrated, they can't execute him. Or he's older and, yeah. you know, I again, it's so hard because I know that these guys did terrible things. And right. so it's hard for me to have sympathy, but at the same time, it's like hard not to have sympathy. Just imagining that they're being viciously poked with needles by people who are actively trying to kill them while you're like hanging upside down. And, they're, and then they're just like, that ah, didn't work out. We'll try to kill you again tomorrow. It's just, that's pretty fucking rough. 
Yeah, I mean, if we're really holding on to the no cruel and unusual punishment, then yeah, they biffed the hell out of that one. But if you're going to kill the dude and he did something so horrible to qualify for that, I I have trouble carrying that much. I found out that one of the arguments that's interesting to me is that uh, these may be cruel, but as we're seeing, they're not unusual. (laughs) It happens a lot. And so technically the Supreme Court could say, like, that's just how it goes. Like, if you decided that giving birth was cruel because it's, it's traumatic for the infant and but the it's, mom and the mom and her vagina but it's not unusual <laughs> all it's, three parties are unhappy it's with the a situation. thing that we have to keep doing and it's just going to be that way yeah. and so that is one of the arguments against the eighth amendment right. applying to executions is that it may be cruel but it's just part of life yeah yeah and it's definitely a part of their life and the end of it yeah yeah mm-hmm. So as of today, there have been three botched attempts to execute Kenneth Eugene Smith. And on November 21st, Alabama Governor Kay Ivey actually called for a moratorium on executions until the prison system can get its act together. This follows a similar move by Tennessee. According to the Associated Press, quote, Earlier this year, after Tennessee Governor Bill Lee halted a lethal injection in April because he learned the drugs hadn't been tested as required, he ordered an independent investigation and paused all executions through the end of the year, unquote. Time will tell whether this is just a bump in the road or an actual harbinger of things to come. As far as I'm concerned, there is no reason to believe that these moratoriums will turn into anything permanent, but I guess we'll see. Yeah, and, you know, you want to talk about a catch-22. All right, we can't kill any more people until we properly test these drugs. How do we properly test these drugs unless we can kill people with them? (laughs) Unfortunately, I guess they test them on animals is probably what they do. Which, if you want to talk about cruel and, well, no, unusual again, uh, no, it's not it's unusual. loophole. Yeah. The Eighth Amendment will get you every time. Now, finally, let's get to the most compelling argument against the death penalty. And we have touched on it a couple times already. And this is the main reason that I struggle with supporting capital punishment. Hmm. In the 49 years between 1973 and today, 186 death row prisoners have been exonerated by DNA evidence or other vindicating circumstances. So just, like, let that sink in. That averages to almost four people a year who would have been wrongly executed if they hadn't been proven innocent in time to save them. Now, technically, there is no proof that anyone who has actually been executed was innocent. Uh, No one has been posthumously exonerated. But that's just because we don't continue to investigate cases after the convicted perpetrator has been dispatched. And, you know, we don't want to be reminded. (laughs) We're like, yeah. No one wants to know. Right. It's a monkey Hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. Yeah. Yeah. The monkey emojis, that's all I know it as. (laughs) It's a monkey emojis uh, dilemma. (laughs) Which only you would understand. Everyone else is like, (laughs) fucking what? (laughs) It is inconceivable to me. Inconceivable! (laughs) That word does mean what I think it means. Yeah. That innocent people have not been executed. It just, 100%, we have executed a ton of innocent people. It's just, again, cruel not unusual. Not unusual. Yeah, I mean, if we're imprisoning people who shouldn't have been imprisoned, we're damn sure killing people who shouldn't have been killed. I do fully believe that jurors try their best. I served as a juror on a murder trial, and someday I will tell that story. But I can attest to the fact that jurors are mostly well-intentioned and always imperfect. Mm. So the bottom line, here is my stance. Uh, for particularly heinous crimes, if there is DNA evidence and there is some way to 100% verify that we have the right person... I am in favor of the death penalty, but I just don't see how we can possibly adhere to that standard consistently. Yeah, and what you've just said, especially in reference to the consistency part, is probably the thing that would keep the death penalty to a very dull roar. Because if you can't supply enough evidence to make it like, yep, open, shut, absolutely, this person did it. Unless you can do that, you don't get to kill them. Well, and you kind of can't ever do that because evidence can be faked. People can be framed. Even DNA evidence could be manipulated by the police or scientists or a a doctor with a vendetta, right? Right. And once we execute someone, there is no opportunity to try to make it up to them if exonerating evidence comes out later. Right. Execution is final. It is irreversible. And I just don't know how we get around the fact that there is no room for error when humans are error prone. Yeah, which is why, I, like I said, I'm, I'm far more into killing people we know are incurable. Like, right. if, you, if you've if you been tested by multiple psychiatrists and they're all like, yeah, he's a sociopath. You can't fix that. Or, yeah, he's like a fourth degree pedophile. Like, get done. I guess I find myself leaning toward abolition. Mm. But then I ask myself, do I want Dylan Roof and, and the guy I mentioned, Daryl Brooks? 
to live a long, healthy life in prison? And the answer is just no. Those guys are 100% guilty, and I personally want them off the face of the earth. It is, it's really hard. There are no easy answers. No, no, which is why I enjoy sometimes being thoroughly stupid, because I just get to make a decision and stick to it. Well, I'm glad I'm not in the position to have to make any of these decisions, but mm. if I were to vote on capital punishment, I, I don't know where I stand. And I'm interested to hear the opinions of all of you insomniacs. So head over to the Discord. Maybe you can convince us one way or the other. We're both uh, conflicted. Yeah, ish. Are you pretty solidly in favor of the death penalty? I think, yeah, like I said, I, I think there are certain cases where if there's a screw up, it's more in terms of the bureaucracy of the thing, yeah. not in the factual nature of the offense or the person conducting it. And I think the reason why so many people are against the, the death penalty is because, A, the huge preponderance of people who are wrongly accused or accused because of racists or, yeah, vengeful whoever the fuck's framing them. There's a terrible history yeah. with the death penalty. I think in, you can definitely make an argument looking at history that there have been miscarriages of justice. Right. However, that said, we're also against it because there's that part of us, I mean, the same reason why nobody wants to see the cow killed that you're going to eat the steak. Like, mm. you don't want to know how it happens. You just want to, you're just glad it did. Right. I don't want a pedophile anywhere near me. I don't want to feed them for the rest of their lives. I don't want to clothe them for the rest of their lives. I don't want to care for, do their fucking health care. But I don't like the idea that someone's going to kill them. Well, that's an interesting point. And I wonder how many people would still be for the death penalty if we were putting every execution on HBO. And if, especially the botched ones, if we all saw that happen, how many people would still be in favor of it? I think that for some people, I still would be in favor of it. Mm -hmm. And I could watch it and go, that's horrible. And I'm, and it's unfortunate that it happened that way. But what this person did is worse in this grand scheme of things. And paying to keep them alive is not worth it. No one can make an argument that convinces me that certain people are just better alive somewhere far away because it saves your soft conscience from taking them out of the mix. Here's an argument. The argument is that there's always the potential for redemption. So imagine, right, thought experiment. Imagine that we kill these people like Daryl Brooks. I think Daryl Brooks needs to be taken out. Don't think he can be saved. Mm -hmm. Then two years later, we have a huge breakthrough in the field of neuroscience you know, or maybe even CRISPR, and they figure out the genetic component that causes sociopathy and narcissism. Mm -hmm. And they're able to suddenly fix people. So now they can suddenly inject you with some CRISPR, and then you're no longer that person. It takes, you know, it fixes the part of you that is broken that makes you that awful. But we killed him. There is a chance down the line that we can save this person, and we should give them every chance to potentially be redeemed later on in life. And also it's good for society as a whole to show mercy, that society benefits from teaching that mercy is important and keeping these people alive and not treating them as badly as they treated someone else, right? We're not going to stoop to their level. It's the whole, it's Michelle Obama. When they go low, we go high, right? Right. I just don't think that that hope justifies the huge expense and danger right. with keeping some of these people alive. Well, that was intense. <laughs> How much of that's ending up on the cutting room floor? <laughs> oh, God. We just like had a 30-minute debate Woo. about the death penalty. I, yeah. We'll see how much of this actually makes it in. Yeah. But uh, it was interesting. Yeah. And I think part of evolution is continuing to have the debate. You don't just leave it in the solved pile. That's not how it goes. You continue to debate the things you think about and the things you think are right in order to question them and eventually probably disprove them if we can evolve past it. And like I said, I'm willing to be persuaded. Yeah. You know, I have had this argument with my dad. I know my dad is very much of an abolitionist for the death penalty. And then my mom is probably a little bit on the other side. And I'm, I'm somewhere in the middle. I do. I vacillate regularly. I am a habitual vacillator. I am not unaware <laughs> of that fact. You waffly bastard, you. <laughs> I'm glad this one's over, to be honest. Yeah. It's, it, it, this one was a brutal one. There were funny points, but yeah, it's, it's kind of hard. We have new maniacs. Yeah! Not the kind that need to be on death row. Yes. But uh, the kind that are the highest tier in our Patreon. We love them. We have uh, Boomsplode Cat. With K A T, um, so not like a not like a cat that went boom. Oh, okay. Like a like a human named Cat. 
ah, with a K. That's bloated. Far <laughs> easier. <laughs> or is in danger of. Who knows? We also have Michael Newman. Newman. <laughs> it's very Seinfeldy. Yes. Yeah. Newman. <laughs> and we have Wonderloo. W O N D E R L U. Lou, who is wonderful, I guess. Hmm. I mean, it's better than Wonderloo L O O, which just means like a wonderful toilet. Three brand new maniacs. That is pretty awesome. I'm fucking for it. And as per usual, please do head over to the Discord uh, where you can find. After midnight episodes, you'll get them there first and they'll be up for a week. If you sign up for our Patreon, you can get the episodes early. There are oh so many fun things. There are great, crazy, wonderful people in the Discord. And then we also still have merch. And we'll have a Check Your Jessup shirt, which I have promised to one of our new uh, patrons. Yep, I will have that out in the next three weeks-ish. Nice. So, with that, and as per usual, and forever after... Knowledge is power. Sleep is overrated. (laughs) 